guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm here today with Tom. Hello to the, the followers. <laughs> and we're going to film Tom's top, is it 12 you've decided? Yeah, 12. Top 12 reads of the year. He's got a mix of fiction and non-fiction. Since you guys said you took an interest in his reading tastes, I thought we would start with his and then we'll build up to mine in later the main videos. Event, if yeah. you like. The He's, headliner. You're the warm-up act for my top 10 of the year. Um, okay, so tell us about your reading year. How many books did you read? Um, thus far, I've read, um, I think, 69 or 70 books. Nice. Is that usual for you? Is this a good year, bad year? What you uh, it's more than I read pre... I've been upping it incrementally the last few years. So I think Since I did, we met? Yeah, That's maybe why. 40 in 2018 and 52 last year yeah. then i upped it to 60 this year um i'm yeah i'm slightly conscious of the fact that because we've been in a global pandemic it's yeah it's been easier to read more books yeah definitely it skewed our taste and what about your fiction to non-fiction ratio um i've read Oh, you're quite... Um, you're quite thick, heavy. You are. But I think that's before we met and before... Like, when I first met Tom and he was... We were talking about our reading taste. You were, like, exclusively a non-fiction reader, weren't you? Yeah. You're very much, like, I read books to learn. I read books to educate myself. And so you've seen the light, um, which I think is interesting. Well, yeah, and I think, obviously, doing a PhD and, like, we're reading non fic all the time yeah and i think uh, like generally you you kind of reach a point where you're like i actually learn a lot more about the experiential and uh i don't yeah those more kind of tacit and sensorial experiences through fiction than yeah. you do through non fic yeah i agree i don't trust people who think that non that fiction reading is like only for fun like yeah i, I feel like that's really um not cool Anyway, we have five of the books here, sneak peek, to show you, and then the other five, or the other seven, quick math, no, six? Wait, how many seven have you got there? Seven. Are on loan to friends, family, or they were audiobooks, right? Or they're in my flat in the Netherlands. Yeah, right. So, do you want to just get started? Do you want me to pick them at random? You haven't ordered them, have you? No, no, let's do them at random. Okay, at first... Up first is Buddha in the Attic by Julie Otsuka. Yes. Tell us about this. When did we? We both read this this year. Actually. Yeah, I think I read it in September or October time. Mm. Um, and it's a story of Japanese migration of women, specifically to um, marry Japanese men. Of are they Japanese men? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're predominantly Japanese in... men who are living in. States. the US um, predominantly on the west coast um, and it's set during the um, the years between both world wars um, and it's told in the collective we which I find really interesting um, seeing as how the narratives around migration tend to be so homogenizing I really enjoy the way it takes that and um, kind of challenges it by putting the we but then using the we to include all of these different experiences and they are so different aren't they yeah, they're talking yeah. about people that have lived in cities people that managed to climb the social ladder and people that remain impoverished and i feel like it yeah it really turns on it on its head the idea that there is only one certain type of person that is a migrant well yeah or there's like a, a typical migrant mm. story if you like and it goes into detail of the uh, internment of Japanese prisoners of wars when World War Two started, and um, she's written a second one, yeah. which I think is set in the internment camps because we reach the end of this as they are being sent away, sort of when we're left on a cliff. Behind. Yeah, but it was certainly a part of history I didn't know that much. About. Um, but yeah, it's a very very poignant book in mm. that regard, and yeah, it's just just wonderful. Yeah, I agree. It's like one of those ones that really taught me very specifically about something I had no idea of like about I'm glad you love that one okay up next you've got a few big hitters coming in but I would like your takes on them yeah of course Girl Woman Other by Bernadette Every so this would be in my top 10 if I didn't already read it last year um tell us your thoughts on our friend well I mean I think obviously the the amount of discussion around this book has kind of 
rendered any of my views quite obsolete. Yeah, but as, as a fan. Yeah, I just... It, it is worthy of all of the hype that it got, I think. Just the, uh, how rich and diverse the different characters were. And it, I suppose similar to that, to the previous book in that it... It takes the idea of kind of blackness and otherness and mm. shows all of the different variations in that. Um, yeah. And what about the right? Like some people have a problem with it that it's only got like two full stops or whatever. Like the, it's quite like experiment. It's not like to be fair. I think you and I both read stuff that's more experimental than this. So maybe this doesn't bother us as much. But I know that was the critique aimed at. It was people were jarred by that. But it doesn't jar you. Not at all. Not no. at all. Me neither. Me I neither. just it's I th- I think in that regard it's just so engrossing because you just keep reading and mm. reading and there's so much to get into. Um, yeah. yeah, it's probably one of the longest books that you read. Yeah, but you just go through it so far. Yeah, I agree. Normally I would be put off by something this size, but I didn't even question it. Sort of like when I read it. Yeah. Glad to see you love that. Okay. Um, switching to. Something very different. Yeah, yeah, let's go off piece. With Who They Was by Gabriel Kraz. This is a proof copy that I got in the summer, which then I lent to Tom because I knew he would have a lot of thoughts on it. Um, it was book a long listed. I don't think it made the short list, but tell us about why you think Who They Was, which arguably is one of the most divisive books. I've yeah. seen a lot of discussion on Bookstagram, people talking about the morality of it and the content being romanticism or glamorising. What do you say to those people? Yeah, well, I, d- I just wholeheartedly disagree with it because I think What's you're... What's the con... Can you explain the context? Yeah, of so we follow... Is it autofic? Yeah, or it like is. He's, kind des- of... he's described it as autofiction, yeah. not memoir. So we kind of follow the journey of Gabriel, Snoops. a.k.a. Snoops, <laughs> um, <laughs> growing up in South Kilburn and kind of... Um, he gets into... It's basically organised yeah, crime. Yeah, organi- organised crime and, like, yeah, the gang culture and stuff, while he's also attending his university degree and in literature, um, reading lots of niche. He loves niche. Um, and, yeah, I just thought it was a really good exploration into this kind of world that you you kind of only hear it from the perspective of people being like, oh, like, Ga- gang life is very bad and like all this mm. stuff. and like, ov- obviously it's it's not something that anyone would want to but you you kind of get a totally different perspective on it um it's really well written as well yeah it's written completely in like a um dialect of a, like colloquial language of their um yeah so it's very exposed. um very evocative of london so mm. i i think yeah maybe if you're from abroad or whatever it might be a bit difficult to kind of figure out what they're talking about yeah definitely it takes it would take a while um, to get used to even some like so many of the slang terms used for like drugs and violence it is extremely violent yeah it is very violent like graphically violent but yeah even yesterday i saw someone criticizing it and they were saying how angry they were when they read this and instead you should read this bbc article which just came out which was interesting about um like the life in gang of the life living in like within a gang in south london i just don't know if i like i don't i can't see that this is doing anything except telling one version of the truth like it's okay that we can believe there's multiple truths existing at once like people can choose this life because they think it's glamorous or they can choose this life because they're born into abject poverty like both those things are true well yeah and i think just the morality thing is like you're you're kind of imposing your own more, and like it's not like in this book he's like oh yeah all of these things I did were absolutely fine. No. Like, he doesn't. That that's not the point of the book at all. It's just it's just telling a different narrative, and I think the reaction to it shows this real. Um, I don't know. I don't know if classism is necessarily the right word, but this real. Um, yeah, I don't know. This tendency to kind of look down on those kind of experiences mm. and say oh like you shouldn't do this and. And, like, people... Yeah, I don't know. It's also, like, I don't see the point in refusing to believe it because it exists. Like, people are determined to to view this, like, negatively. But at the end of the day, this still goes on and it still happens and there's people, like, being killed and 
participating in it so like why are we pretending that it doesn't well, yeah, why doesn't that deserve a place in our like in a wide range of narratives we read about our city well yeah and one of my favorite oh, sorry i'm i'm aware we're going quite long on this one, <laughs> but just one of my favorite bits of that is like where he talks about london as this this mishmash of this like mm. um, patchwork of different worlds and it's like for one person like they might get robbed or something and that's like this abnormal thing that happens yeah. it's kind of out of their their regular sphere but like for him it's like every his every day and like yeah there's it's definitely food for thought i think for sure one i'll give you a spoiler that's going to feature in mine is that reminds me by derek awusu another beautiful london writer writing about also a piece of semi-auto fiction or like inspired by his own life events i would say tell us why you loved mr derek awusu um just the pure poetry of mm -hmm. it the way it kind of weaves in that west african folklore with is it a Anansi? a nancy a nancy the spider yeah yeah um so a story of a boy growing up in care and then um being like taken to a foster family and like but, outside of london and then returned to his biological family y yeah and just it's a kind of tale of dissociation and kind mm -hmm. of yeah, trying to negotiate his identity within that space, like in the context of being in his foster family and then going back into London and reuniting with his biological mother and kind of the the emotional and psychological toll that that exacted on him as a young black man. Mm. I'm just thinking now so many of like, I think it would be the same for me, like most of the books we read are focused on identity and looking at individual character identity like i mean the one i'm about to hold up is quite plotty but the rest are not really yeah we're definitely people people aren't we <laughs> yeah okay the last one we have in hardback show you is dominicana by angie cruz another one that had some online critique and discussion around the um the discourse like what was happening in the book but tell us why you like this is also based angie cruz based this primarily on the experiences of her mother immigrating from Dominicana to New York. Um, so, yeah, another own voices story. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you, you've already told the listeners, but I, I did, oh, and I have previously worked a lot with migrant communities, and that was one of my major research interests in my master's and in my undergraduate degree. So, I, and I still read a lot about a lot of literature surrounding um, diasporic communities in different places. Um, and I, yeah, I still have a real interest in how, yeah, in, in those sorts of experiences. Um, yeah, it's, it's the tale of Anna and her migration and her from the Potentially Dominican not even migration, arguably underage marriage slash yeah. kidnap, would you um, suggest? Yeah, and that, to an that, older, yeah. wealthier, um, like Dominican man who's already immigrated to New York, and she bring, he brings her over on a green card, even though she's fifteen. Yeah, and it's very he's... questionable. <laughs> yeah, but that's not to say it shouldn't be written in that context because that is what happens. So, again, with the morality thing, is that yeah, and I that think is reality. It does a really good job of juxtaposing her life in the Dominican Republic with her life in New York and the, this idea of like the aspirational migrant mm -hmm. and what they leave behind to what they go and do and the way that they're treated in the US and uh and also like what what their role is when they migrate this is so much about family and the reason why she makes these sacrifices and signs up for a marriage that she's not interested in participating in is for the sake of her family because her mother wants to also immigrate and she wants like her siblings yeah it's like a whole like family loyalty thing isn't it yeah and i think it it talks really eloquently about the alienation that mm -hmm. is felt as a migrant in a new place like about her trying to speak the language and especially in a city like new york that's so like in your face just her how, world feels so small, doesn't yeah, it? Even yeah. though she's in this huge city that's like all glitz and glamour, but really we only see her existence within like a few hundred feet of her apartment. Yeah, it's... Uh... 
I really loved that. Yeah. And I liked the short scenes. It was super quick. Yeah, I love it. I loved this book. <laughs> Great. Okay, what have you got on audio? Um, tell us what you audioed this year that you loved. Right, so what I audioed... She Said? Was, yeah, She Said by Jodie Cantor and Megan... Tui? Tui. <laughs> Tuohe. No. Um, and these were... This is the story of the two journalists that broke the... Harvey Weinstein, um, me too. I don't know what what's the right word. Scandal story. Yeah, I don't know if it's scandal is the right word, is it? Just no, like because that. it's very very believable. Yeah, like they yeah. exposed the abuse that Weinstein participated in over a number of yeah, years and in Hollywood. You, it's just. Yeah, a wonderful book into the lengths that were gone to to try and prevent the story from coming out. So all the gross, wasn't all it? the institutional obstacles that they came up against from, I don't know, like lawyers and stuff that are meant to be like progressive. Yeah, that was so interesting. Yeah. The big name, like feminist lawyer, and it really spoke to that culture of capitalism and protecting your worth when that when you you're marketing yourself as doing the right thing, but when the right thing is, like, up against you losing out on money, then money always wins. Well, yeah, and just the, the culture of fear that... He, he, I mean, it's created... Not, not necessarily just in Hollywood, but in institutions yeah. more generally that people don't feel like they can come forward just because the emotional toll it takes is... I also loved how it was written by the both of them. Like yeah, I love, yeah. I'm really into collaborative nonfiction. I feel like that, that should be a thing. Like I, I just really liked that, um, and I loved Rose McGowan in it. I want yeah. to read her memoir now. Yeah, she is really great. Um, what else did you audio? Say nothing. Yeah, say nothing by Patrick Rad and Keith. This one's for you, um, Jay. He wants to read this. He's put it on his shelves. It is the most comprehensive account of the troubles uh, in Ireland. It must be noted that Patrick O'Keefe is... He's American. He's American with Irish ancestry, I believe. I mean, I mean most of America claim yeah. Irish ancestry. Don't um, so, I don't know, I did see... I've only seen a couple of criticisms suggesting that he was not the right person to write the book, but he has a PhD, doesn't he, in... Like, he's, like, heavily yeah, involved yeah. in the scholarship around it, which I think is, um, to me, that's credit-worthy as someone to write a non-fiction book. Yeah, it's just the, the complexity of it as a body of work is absolutely mind-blowing. Like, it must have taken them so long to put together, and you get a lot of, um, a lot of the information is from accounts with people that were involved in the IRA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the interviews. That's why it's so good on audio as well, isn't it? Because he's talking about these tapes that are recorded. Yeah. Which you then listen to. But if you've never read about the Troubles, I would say that it would be like quite an undertaking yeah, to quite, listen to. Yeah, quite, quite a lot. But um, yeah, and the obviously the complexity it goes into is quite... Um, quite a lot yeah I will link it's a more than an overview <laughs> yeah definitely and I don't know if there is any books that really give it an overview and I don't know if it is actually possible to overview something like that in recent history because it's so inflammatory still well and, yeah like, and so it, it goes into that in the book with um the kind of laws around the storage of the mm. statements of people that are involved in the IRA and kind of protecting the them involved, yeah, from going to the so FBI. So interesting, so, so interesting. Um, and I think, I mean, especially as we hurtle towards a no-deal Brexit and the, obviously in the past years, the relationship with Ireland and Northern Ireland has been so much uh, back in the news. Yeah, it's definitely one, if you are, like, if you live in the UK, it's one to read and inform yourself on as it's obviously severely lacking from our current career. So the ne the final audiobook I listened to is Afropean by the lovely John Johnny Pitts. Pitts. Uh, Rez in his native Sheffield burr. Yeah, lovely. Um, it explores his... It's a journey. Yeah, book, it's, it's a it? travel log yeah. of his uh, experience as a black man um, travelling through cities in Europe and his... 
So, so the book is Afropean, which is this scholarly concept taken from some writer whose name escapes me. <laughs> That's okay. But, um, and it, yeah, he goes in search of what it means to be a black person in Europe and the intersections of Africa and Europe and how that relationship is actually a lot more established than, um, yeah, I don't know, a lot of whitewashed Europe mm. kind of kind of presents. Um, we he goes to Paris, um, Amsterdam. Yeah, you found Moscow. the the chapters on the Netherlands obviously extremely interesting to learn about. Um, your like obviously now you live there and stuff yeah, to understand yeah. their concept of racism oh, and yeah and just their history of colonialism and the kind of absence of um the language to discuss these things I yeah and just the the lack of public knowledge mm. um and education about these issues um and yeah it's really just really good really well written <laughs> he like explores the culture he explores food he explores travel systems like it's a travel book it's also like a memoir and it's also an exploration of blackness so yeah one i would i would also recommend yeah um so we've got i'll do the last fiction one okay so uh, my name is leon by kit devore which i actually spoke about briefly previously so yes because you were reading supporting cast weren't you yes but this is kit devore's um fiction book isn't it like full-length fiction book yeah similar themes well it's about the foster care system isn't it yeah and about yeah this boy kind of growing up in um like in a single parent family and his mother's yeah. kind of not <laughs> uh his mother has a lot of mental health problems and you kind of you experience the breakdown of his family and his experience moving into foster care through his eyes yeah right? through his eyes which i think i would find like i'm not big on child protagonists but you thought it yeah. was powerful yes yeah, so powerful and you know they just really um quite quite emotionally shattering yeah i think i would find it the same what other two do you have left um Black i've got Raven. three left uh, what are they in the dream house oh uh, yeah by carmen maria mccardo um we love have you have bit. you already spoken about this but i know we already spoke about it briefly on a previous video and it will also be in my favorites but just know tom likes it as well yeah it was great it. We just lent it to a friend that we were FaceTiming last night and she was sharing how much she loved it. And I think it's one of those ones that anyone we lend it to, they will get something out of it. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and what about your, your niche recommendation of the year? Angels with Dirty Faces by Jonathan Wilson. So this didn't actually come out this year. No, it doesn't have to come out. None oh. of these come out. Some of these didn't come out this oh. year. Oh, well, it's not niche, really. If you're into, if you're into football... Um, I'm sure you'll be aware of the writings of Jonathan Wilson, who wrote Inverting the Pyramid, which is kind of the football tactics bible. Um, and he's written a number of other books about different figures, like Brian Clough. And uh, he's written a lot about football behind the, uh, the Iron Curtain as oh, yeah, well. Like that. So what's Angels with Dirty Faces? So Angels with Dirty Faces is the comprehensive footballing history of Argentina and it traces it f or traces football in Argentina from its roots in um, Scottish migration to Argentina and how it developed and uh, how important it is to the Argentinian psyche in this country which kind of is predominantly was it was this kind of cross-pollination of lots of different people because it's mm -hmm. lots of um, like Italian migrants, um, Spanish migrants, and how you unite all of those people. And football was the way that was done. Um, and about how, yeah, obviously... Does it make you want to go to Argentina? Oh, yeah. I mean, I wanted to go beforehand, but yeah. And I think especially recently with Diego Maradona's passing, uh, RIP Diego, um... <laughs> just yeah there, i think there's two separate chapters on him um and just the the place he occupied in 
Argentinian folklore and mythos. It, it, yeah, it's chronological, so it runs through the 20th century. Um, yeah, obviously up to, I mean, including the great Argentinian World Cup winning sides of 78 and 86. And then uh, obviously on to more modern day. Um, and what's the last book you read of the year? The last one is Black Wave. What that you read that you love, sorry. Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the rivalry that unraveled the Middle East by Kim Gattas, or Hattas, however you might say it. Um, yeah, again, this is a really comprehensive history. You're big on comprehensive histories this year. <laughs> yeah, I am. No, it's good to get a good deep look. You have a really yeah, good stamina I think for that as well. I think I get bored. Especially in regard to the Middle East, it's so compli- and it, again, it's, I mean, it's a bit like when people speak of Africa as being like one thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it goes, it delves a lot into the, particularly f kind of from the 60s and 70s onwards. To the revolution. Yeah, through the Iranian revolution and Saudi Arabia and how the, the other countries in the Middle East, like Lebanon, um, Syria and how they were kind of caught in yeah these the, the crossfire of relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran does it touch on like the western like the way the west unsettled it and caused them um... yeah yeah so it wasn't it's a good like look at also like colonialism and how, well, yeah, I mean, how I, we've been continuing yeah to fuck I mean up the you world. can't really speak about the Middle East without speaking of colonialism and the Pike Seeker Agreement mm. and the way the West propped up all of these regimes that were beneficial to them, like in Iran, um, and the way they continue to do trade with Saudi Arabia now and what that means for the way we look at the Middle East and what's going on there. Interesting. It'll definitely be on my 2021 to read. I'm going to get on audio though, but yes. Okay. That's a real good mix of the year. So you've read a lot of history and a lot of character focused, non white British, really. My story graph says I like books which are reflective, emotional and challenging. I think mine says the same. I think it says that to everyone to bolster our egos. Really? <laughs> I, I thought know. I was, yeah, a deep and brooding soul. <laughs> you are that too. You are that too. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, guys. Please comment below if you'd like more Tom content. And we will see you uh, next week for more videos. Bye.